George Machunas, what is flux? George, uh, how did Genghis Khan count the dead after a battle? Well, you see, the Mongolian armies were very efficient. And um, to count dead could be a very laborious process if you just ask one man to count. Let's say there were 100,000 dead, could take him a couple of days. Mm -hmm. Or if you were in a hurry and asked everybody to count, they may count the same bodies several times. So that wouldn't work either. And um, for the Mongolian armies, it was important to move fast and also to have precise information about uh, the enemy. So if they um, knew how many of the enemy were lost in a particular battle, they would know how many there left. So it was all had to be very precise intelligence. So they, they worked out a method where they could do it quickly and uh, accurately. They asked everyone in their uh, army to cut an, one ear from any of the dead bodies. Oh, then uh, they would just throw the ears in a bag. This way there's no duplication because if you found already a body with one ear, you wouldn't cut the other one. Mm. Now then, as soon as they got all the ears in the bags on, they would hop on their horses and off they go. Then at leisure while they're riding, each can count their ears by taking it out of the bag and throwing it out. Okay. When they have done all that, on the next stop, they get together and they just add all the totals and they have the figure. And they've got the figure. My God. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. Well, well uh, what, uh, George, what is flux? found out about the years was that I, uh, for the last year I've been doing uh, historical boxes for my yeah. friends. They sort of like birthday, birth year boxes. Okay. So I would ask each of my friends what year they were born in, and then I would make like a souvenir box that would contain all kinds of objects and uh, peculiar information or whatever from that particular year. And uh, I asked George Brecht what was, nobody knows incidentally his birth year. So I, I asked him, what, what is it, 1923, 1925? <laughs> he said, oh, 1250. <laughs> right. Okay. Right now, therefore, I had to dig up all kinds of uh, information, like what, uh, what um, uh, tools were used, or um, how food was eaten, how it was cooked, uh, what kind of music existed then and uh, all kinds of other historical and technical facts of that particular year or century. I see. And uh, I was going to include an ear. A human ear? Yeah, except oh. no hospital will give it to me. <laughs> they just throw them away. <laughs> so I need a human ear. <laughs> okay. okay. What, uh, what other kind of boxes are you, uh, have you been doing lately? Well, um, I could describe some the earlier ones, like in 1964, Ben Wattier, who is uh, one of the uh, hardcore flux men, we don't like to call flux art artists, just a flux man. <laughs> uh, hardcore. <laughs> a, a flux worker. <laughs> okay. He um, used to bottle dirty water in little perfume bottles uh -huh. and you know, sell it like for the same price as perfumes. <laughs> 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 Had a very dirty water. <laughs> But we haven't sold any so far. You haven't sold any so far? <laughs> so we have many gallons of it <laughs> sent up for some eventual lucky day when we can dispose of it. <laughs> then uh, George Brecht um, has done a lot of boxes and I would sort of... Uh, he acknowledges uh, like his uh, uh, boxes as an um, influence partly by Joseph Cornell boxes. Now. Yeah, so uh, there is like the tradition of the surrealist boxes and then which was transmitted to George Brecht and Bob Watts 
uh, by way of Joseph Cornell. Now, um, George Brecht has done uh, a whole series of puzzles, games and puzzles, and some of the puzzles were like a little ball in a box with a card reading, observe the ball rolling uphill. <laughs> I could okay. wait all your life <laughs> waiting for this to happen. <laughs> or there were some, like, uh, what you would call uh, exercises or mind exercises, where there would be one card, and on one third side, uh, George Brecht would say that whatever Ben Watte on the other side says is uh, wrong. Okay. And uh, meanwhile, on the other card, Ben Watte would say whatever George Brecht says is right. Now what happens, if George Brecht is right about Ben Watte, then Ben Watte must be wrong okay. in his statement, which makes George Brecht wrong, okay. which makes again Ben Watte right. So <laughs> it changes all the time, it oscillates. And has an oscillation process. Yeah, right. and it's like never still. <laughs> Or like in the 60s, we must have produced uh, 100 different boxes, which most of them had this uh, uh, element of humor. And uh, I think that's what distinguished our boxes from surrealist uh, earlier boxes, or any boxes done by others now. Uh -huh. um, How big are these boxes, George? Well, they vary from like just uh, two inches or so, and the biggest one would be like a suitcase. Okay. So, uh, and all kinds of sizes in between. Um, for instance, uh, there is a, in 1970, Jeff Hendricks did a little reliquary, which was to complement a flux mass that we did. Okay. Uh, and the reliquary has all, like it has a tiny little pebble, and it says that that's the last... Uh, rock that killed St. James the Less, who was killed by stoning, you see. But that pebble is just like tiny, <laughs> quarter inch across. <laughs> Looks like he just had enough. <laughs> then we had even a penny distancing machine yeah. with millions of those little pebbles. Now each one was the last one that killed him. You would put a coin and you would get the <laughs> last Where did you pebble. get that idea from? <laughs> well, actually, uh, there is a, a real early predecessor of flux object, and that was um, in Alexandrian school. Alexandria, they had uh, like a, a scientific community who just sat around thinking up of sometimes useful, sometimes completely useless objects, like toys, theater pieces. And they've done a lot of um, very valuable research in anatomy and uh, mechanical engineering. That was like between 300 and 200 uh, BC. So I discovered they had uh, a coin-operated dispensing machine dispensing holy water, <laughs> which was just squirted on you. <laughs> you put a penny and pow, you get it. Okay. <laughs> so in a sense, that we took off. Then uh, I discovered that during medieval times, monasteries were manufacturing relics. Uh, because, uh, right, and they were just making thousands of true nails and so on. Because there was a recent study of, of uh, somebody made a recent study of all the true nails of the cross, okay. and found that there was like a couple of seven, a couple of tons. <laughs> I mean, you could build a locomotive with it. <laughs> just literally, every village in Europe has a true nail. <laughs> so, and with with it um, in that reliquary, there are all sorts of other objects that sort of make fun out of it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Then. Um, Every uh, person in our group did uh, some kind of boxes, and our last uh, version was to put them all in a cabinet of drawers. So that we have uh, 20 drawers, and maybe done by 10 different people. I see. And there would be one which um, has uh, all like a dozen music movements, which you can turn them all together, okay. like 12 different songs that can play simultaneously. Or uh, let's say Joe Jones piece. He, he's doing a lot of work with um, automatic or self-playing musical instruments okay. or music boxes. He would take a music movement from a music box and destroy some of the prongs, you know, like uh -huh. take break off half of them. So you just have like 
bits and fragments of the song. <laughs> Just like a couple of tongues keep repeating. <laughs> um, and then, there, well, there's some objects. There is a, also a recent object of Larry Miller is a fan, for a ceiling fan, which goes as slow as a clock, very slow. Earth. And then another, on a the wall, there is a clock that has the fan motor, so it goes as fast as the fan. <laughs> so you have two useless objects. <laughs> fan that doesn't working. cool, and yeah, and a clock that doesn't give time. <laughs> okay. Where, what uh, museums are these exhibited in, these uh, boxes, that type of thing? You're well, uh, <clears throat> up to like last year, no museum, and uh, there were just two collectors. Of, oh. And there are two uh, archives that originally started as archives of Dada collections. And uh, then expanded into include uh, flux objects. One is in uh, Germany, uh, Hans Sohm archives, and uh, about equal size archive is in uh, Thuringia in Massachusetts of Jean Brown. And that, those archives have almost complete uh, uh, all our objects that we made, which oh. must be like uh, several hundred. Several hundred. Yeah, objects, documents, I mean, um, even furniture. There's like whole, a quartet or orchestra of Joe Jones. Uh, all kinds of musical chairs that you would, like there is a chair where, uh, they're sort of like box-like chairs. And those were made by Takako Saito, who also has done uh, like sound chess or musical chess pieces. But the chairs are... Uh, very funny also because they uh, when they serve like one man you may sit down and uh, there would be a rolling ball inside when you sit down the ball rolls from one corner to another you mm -hmm. get up it rolls again mm -hmm. or another chair may produce a puddle of water and then it <laughs> 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 or another chair would squirt at your neighbor water <laughs> so you set them up for dinner like well <laughs> right on the table, right yeah. on the table. each right. chair is, is an event <laughs> Uh, well, George, let's get back a little bit. Uh, how did Fluxus get its start? Uh, well, Alexander uh, School, is that? Yeah, uh, <laughs> 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 Alexander School. Uh, actually, the sort of more obvious start is uh, in uh, when the name was first used, in 1960, or uh, I think it's 1961, fall, late 1961. At, uh, and that was a sort of direct influence um, it was influenced directly by uh, the school of John Cage that he had in um, the new school, where people like George Brecht, Dick Higgins, Jackson McClough were taking, uh, in 1958 to 59, I think, they were taking a class. And all those people later were associated with, with Fluxus. Um, then there are sort of indirect influences of uh, all like um, uh, you've got quite a chart here. Yeah, I have, yeah. <laughs> like um, I would say like anti-art uh, uh, statements of uh, Vladimir Mayakovsky, who influenced uh, Henry Flynn directly. And Henry Flynn was sort of a, a peripheral uh, a flux person. Sometimes he was, sometimes he wasn't. But uh, he was, I would say. Uh, Sympathetic uh, observer. <laughs> sympathetic observer. <laughs> then um, I would say strong influence of uh, like vaudeville and just plain gags of like Buster Keaton or Spike Jones. Even if we, some of us may not have known of Spike Jones, but he would definitely be like a precursor. And uh, futurist theater, I think, also uh, played important uh, part in influencing us. Um, then Marcel Duchamp is probably the greatest influence, and uh, he influenced John Cage in turn, who influenced us. Right, right. <laughs> and uh, then the Dadas, but especially the Taris Dadas, they, they were doing more events then. Okay. In Zurich they uh, had some events in uh, Cabaret Voltaire, but in Taris they were doing almost like street events or uh, tours and, you know, uh, more varied kind of events, rather than just a Cabaret situation. When are the street events starting to happen now? Uh, yeah. Uh, mm. The street events are starting to happen now with the uh, Dadas then? Ye Interest. Yes, uh -huh, yeah. And, um, uh, well, they had 
uh, events where there's one very famous one where um, the audience was, uh, you know, the way audience usually throw tomatoes at performance. Right. The performers, when they don't like it, well, here the performers came out with baskets of tomatoes. <laughs> Time to throw them at the audience. Yeah, it's, uh, right, I think everyone knows that one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, well, the futurists have done even before that. They've done things like uh, they would have a whole play, they lift the curtain only like a couple inches. And the whole play would go on behind. You just see the feet. They call it foot theater. <laughs> foot. <laughs> yeah. But uh, that's sort of similar to a piece of Ben Wattier, who um, uh, has a lot of theater uh, shock pieces, as he calls. And there would be, uh, for instance, um, uh, a play going on, and all announced, so the people would come for that play, but the door is locked. Meanwhile, the play starts and goes on. <laughs> and they just, you know, they hear all the noises, but they cannot get in. <laughs> oh, okay. so they're beating on the outside. Or uh, there is another audience piece like that, similar, where uh, at the end of the concert, we would tell that, well, the last piece has to be performed in a secret place, and we have to take one row at a time to that place. So the usher will take the first row there of people, they would follow him, and he would just take them down the back exit into the street, <laughs> out of the theater. Meanwhile, the rest, you know, they all sort of drinking in anticipation, what's that next piece? <laughs> and, just one, and they'll never know, except when they actually go through it. <laughs> right. So that goes on for an hour. Yeah. <laughs> oh, George, what's flux? there is a uh, piece in the beginning where it works only with all the seats are numbered and the tickets also are numbered. Right. And um, in fact, that piece was done by the Futurists in 1913, I think, uh, where, no, I think, yeah, the Futurists done a, a, a piece where the, like 20 tickets would be sold to the same seat in the same evening. <laughs> and then, you know, 20 people want to get to that chair and have a big fight. <laughs> and, uh, I think that's a danger piece. Yeah, yeah. Then there is one where, again, the number seats, and we just announced that, well, there was a terrible mistake made, and the person who has the sixth seat should change with 16, oh. you know? And then uh, number four should change with 14. And like, eh, big mess, everybody's changing their seats <laughs> for the next half hour. <laughs> <laughs> These uh, are your concerts, uh, getting into your concert things then. Yes, yeah, so as I was work. saying, in, well, in 1961, we were doing uh, events and concerts of this sort. Uh, not just we, there were many artists doing, like uh, Lamont Young and Bob Morris. Uh, Eve Klein was doing even before that, like what he calls Monotone Symphony. And Ben Bautier was doing on his own in... Uh, in Nice. Uh, so 1959 like happening started of Alan Capra. Right. Uh, even though there were happenings before. Actually, the first happening was in 1952. At, uh, it was called uh, Concerted Action at the Black Mountain College. At Black Mountain. Yeah, yeah. where uh, John Cage, Cunningham, and uh, Rauschenberg performed. And the same year, uh, Georges Mater did a happening painting uh, Battle of Bouvines. Now, few people know about him, mean, yet he influenced the Japanese Gutai group, because he was uh, in Japan in 1957, okay. and Gutai started in, in oh, 57. Okay. And Gutai so is he, the Japanese... Uh, sort of action uh, uh, happening group, okay. yes. Uh, so that in 1960, uh, there was a lot of this uh, happening and events uh, going on, <coughs> and uh, what happened in... Um, in uh, uh, right after that year, they sort of tended to break into two camps, like the serious and the humorous, and or I would call like neo baroque and neo haiku. You know, like haiku okay. here, one thing at a time, very simple, sort of like a gag. And uh, neo baroque would be like lots of things going on at the same time, like uh, spectacles of Louis XIV in Versailles. Right. So uh, and meanwhile, like. The, the humorous things would be, or like uh, some of Buster Keaton uh, gags. Uh, did this 
and these groupings take place in uh, very informally. Yeah, yeah, very okay. informally, and they uh, they may not even have been aware that, uh, or we may not have been aware that there were those groupings. But what happened is that uh, our first plan was to publish a magazine, Fluxus, and that's how the name came about. And we just like the dictionary meaning, and there are several meanings <laughs> which anybody can look up. But uh, it it sort of naturally tended to uh, attract uh, people that were doing those humorous things, and uh, and then the name sort of stuck to to. Well, the magazine never came out in time. It came like five or four years after <laughs> we started to plan it. We just found that it was too costly to do. But contests were easy to do. So, like in, in 1962, we had uh, a whole series of contests in Europe, because it was especially easy to do them there. I just went like to Wiesbaden, the uh, 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 mayor, and told him, well, we'd like to do a festival of American music, you know, new American music. <laughs> he thought, well, you know, so <laughs> he figured, okay, he doesn't even know John Cage. <laughs> so he probably thought, uh, I don't know what. <laughs> Any good money? Yeah, something like that. Oh, he said, yeah. fine. Yeah. He'll give us like 20 uh, theater in the museum for 20 concerts. Yeah. Okay. And then the first concert, and that's when the Flux Fest was used first, or something like it, Flux, uh, Fluxus okay. uh, concert. The first concert, I remember, we obtained a sort of a real junk piano, grand piano that video was of, couldn't even be repaired. So we thought the best way to dispose of it would be to destroy it. <laughs> and in fact, we like started a whole fad of destroying, you know, like, after 1962, there were every college <laughs> they were destroying, yeah, but usually good piano. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we had this piano, and then we found, we, we tried to do it very gentle way with screwdrivers, and no, it wouldn't work. We just had to, you know, break it up with sledgehammers. Uh, uh, Meanwhile, the audience and all the newspapers, they thought we were destroying the museum piano. <laughs> the, called us cultural uh, Bolsheviks. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> now, the mayor, the mayor was in, uh, on vacation somewhere in Switzerland. <laughs> so they recalled him. They all, he almost lost his job. <laughs> they, but they never asked us of that, where we got the piano. They just assumed it was the museum piano. Oh, completely no. demolished. <laughs> oh, no. But they didn't stop us. I mean, they, we kept doing those concerts then. We traveled to uh, Copenhagen, Dusseldorf, Amsterdam, Haag, in Paris. Then in Nice, which um, was sort of the end of the European, the uh, first European tour, I think it was 1964, where Ben Wauthier was living. In fact, there is a whole group of French artists, like Armand is from Nice too, and so like many of the novel realists are uh, connected with Nice. So sometimes they call Nice school. <laughs> but the city itself is very conservative. So there, usually we had no problem with obtaining theaters, but in Nice, the theater director chickened out the last minute and he didn't want to just close it in front of our faces, so he just called like truckfuls of police <laughs> to surround the whole theater and no <laughs> audience, no performance admitted. <laughs> so oh, then we my. thought, hmm, we thought, well, if we can do it in a the theater, we'll do it on the street. So that's how we started to do street performance. And Ben Wojtyla is a very good street performer. He just loves to do it. And oh, we've we done dozens of pieces, but there was one piece that really especially uh, fitted Nice. In um, Nice, have like the Grand Boulevard, which is right along the seashore. And right. on one side, they're flanked by very fancy hotels. Then the other side has a beach and a sea. And in the evening, like, everybody's out on that boulevard, and all the cars just sort of drive back and forward promenade. to show off. Yes, yeah. uh -huh. like an automobile promenade. So we had, uh, we sort of had like eight performers all bunched together, very tight, and going in very tiny steps, like half-inch little steps, across the street, <laughs> you know. And, oh, we had all, like, winter clothing and bowler hats, very or formally dressed. Right. And... Uh, all the cars would have to store and like wait for 10 minutes till we, you know, took all this way of crossing them. We would everything. cross the boulevard and then just continue on through the beach, down, down, down into the water <laughs> until <laughs> that ball had float away. <laughs> that was like a straight line. <laughs> oh, beautiful. <laughs> but beautiful. I even, then I saw recently a cartoon even, like uh, a New Yorker magazine, I think. And that's like uh, I would call it a flux uh, cartoon. Uh, <laughs> they had a whole busload of executives 
were brought into the beach, and they all just marched right into the sea right. <laughs> in the same way. Oh, my God. But there, there are many uh, events and, and objects that we haven't done that are sort of done uh, not even as an art. Like, I think there's, uh, sometimes they just sold like gags. I saw one, I found one box that uh, probably is from 1920s. What exactly is flux, George? It says on the top, for the man who has nothing. Then when you open the box, it's just smooth. There's no hollow, you know, like two blocks of wood. And then it says inside, and, and here is a place to keep it in. <laughs> and then nothing. <laughs> and it's like there's absolutely no void inside the box. <laughs> that would be a true flux object. That's so beautiful. <laughs> so you got... Uh, and this was about your first... Uh, yes, then, well, then there's, uh, like, uh, Ben Watier was uh, very active, uh, and he still is. He had a piece, uh, which he has done in Nice, and then we repo uh, repeated it up here again. Uh, what he did in Nice, he took, a b uh, chartered a bus, filled it up with people, and then took them up on a mountain, like a couple miles from the city. And then when they all got off the bus, he quickly came back with an empty bus. <laughs> so they had to walk all the way back. <laughs> took them, like, four hours. <laughs> then we thought, hmm, we'll do that in New York. And uh, they had some show where Ben was participating in the Guggenheim Museum. So the museum provided us with a bus, and uh, they thought we'll just tour the city or something. So um, we planned to, we thought, all right, we'll, and it was midnight, and the fall in November was sort of drizzly night, too. <laughs> we thought, we'll go to the middle of the uh, Bear Mountains, which yeah. is... Uh, you know, we, neither of us knew about Bear Mountains. And then we started to drive and on and on. We saw that that was a very big forest. <laughs> if we leave those people in there, <laughs> they'll maybe freeze to death or something. <laughs> so then we, we sort of had to improvise quickly some solution which wouldn't be so harsh. And um, we, uh, we had all the people come out of the bus, and I gave everybody a flashlight. Then we say, now we're going to go up the little hill there to uh, have like a picnic or some games, <laughs> like mm -hmm. 2 o'clock in the morning. Uh -huh. And well, okay, they all falling. A little suspicious, but, you know, as long as we're around, they figure it's okay, because, you know, uh, we're with them. And meanwhile, I told the bus driver to drive like a half a mile to a different spot on the road and wait for us there. Right. Now we went up to the little hill, and I say, well, for the next piece, now I have to collect all the flashlights. So I collected the flashlights, and I ran off. <laughs> <laughs> so now they had to find their way through the dark to the spot where they thought the bus was, <laughs> but then the bus meanwhile had moved. So it took them a couple hours <laughs> to get the bus. <laughs> Did you lose some friends that night? No, actually, yeah. there were no friends in that bus. <laughs> they were the strangers. Oh, I see. <laughs> <laughs> but probably they would never buy our objects. <laughs> no, not. We had... Um, plan to do a big festival in uh, San Gimignano in Italy, which is a very well-preserved, um, like, 14th, 15th century town near Siena, where they still have all the towers that originally all the towns had, or like 30 or 40 towers. So we thought we would do a piece especially for that city, for the town, using the towers, oh. like spin a giant spider web between the towers by, you know, <laughs> shooting rope with arrows <laughs> or uh, uh, throwing down all kinds of noisemakers with parachutes from different uh, towers, like alarm clocks or sirens or whatever. And uh, um, also they have an interesting uh, wall all around the town with two gates, rather high wall. So on, uh, well, on completion of the festival, we were going to as we leave, we would lock them in. <laughs> so that, instead of being locked out, they would be all locked in in their town. <laughs> Did this come Just that two gates. No, they all, when they saw our program, <laughs> they weren't. <laughs> they, they, uh, they chickened out. <laughs> but uh, we may still do, we like to do for each different uh, city 
uh, an event that hits the city, that there's some peculiarity in the city. I see. I uh, see. So, like, for instance, here in Seattle, we uh, plan to do a, a bus event, since the bus system is so well organized here. Uh, well, I thought you know, that would be a, like a compliment for the city I to see. do a special uh, event for the bus. And the idea was to, originally, the idea was to, like, use the transfer system in such a way, in zigzag fashion, that you almost get in and get off the next stop and transfer to the next line and then off again. Okay. So that you can almost use up the whole bus system, not the, all the routes, but all the numbers of the buses. I see. Uh -huh. But then I found out that there is sometimes a lot of waiting. <laughs> like 15 <laughs> minutes, that would take like all week, <laughs> maybe. Right. Right. So I thought, well, the next best thing was to use this magic uh, carpet system and just go back and forward, you know, like in a circle. Okay. Keep switching for a whole day, but not just passengers, but we'll say like eight of us, and each with very giant package, like a big carton or a mattress or an umbrella that you cannot close, <laughs> you know, <laughs> or a, a long tube <laughs> or a big painting or something like that. And then we just kept, keep coming in and out. So that eventually the drivers would see us, you know, like maybe an, an hour or two later, he would see the same group <laughs> of people with the big packages coming in again. <laughs> but uh, it was raining that day, and uh, nobody showed up. Nobody so showed the tour up. didn't go off. Oh, okay. <laughs> it was bad luck with the rain. <laughs> well, there was one other original uh, piece that we'll talk about later. I hope that wasn't considered a compliment to the city. <laughs> the uh, toilet piece, which we'll... Oh, well... <laughs> <laughs> You got into sports and games at one point. At one point, when yes. Was this well, um, we uh, when we started to do street events, it sort of led naturally into game-like things, and then next thing we were doing sports. George, could you tell me what flux is? or so, uh, where we were preparing uh, ping pong rackets in, a, in different funny ways, like uh, have a rock attached to it so it makes it very heavy, or uh, a big hole inside, or you know things like that. And then we were preparing badminton rackets in the same way, and then or playing um, soccer on stilts, uh, or try shot put with roller skates. You know, like, it's impossible, yeah. <laughs> it goes nowhere, just like a couple of feet from you. Because <laughs> you roll back, as you throw, you roll back too. <laughs> right. Right. So you oh. need a, a action and this reaction thing has to work so that you're standing still <laughs> on the ground. Or balloon javelins, or, um, uh, you know, we were taking existing sport uh, uh, sports and, like, preparing them the way John Cage prepares the piano. So we could call it, you know, prepared sports. We had the uh, obstacle shoe races where uh, the shoes would be prepared. Like, for instance, you take swimmers, flippers, and attach, extend them by attaching even, like, wooden boards. You know, so you're like a giant duck foot. <laughs> That's appropriate. <laughs> like four feet long. Short. Yeah, very hard to run with them. <laughs> or uh, run uh, on grass with roller skates. Or, uh, okay. uh, re like, so you couldn't bend your knees, you insert your uh, uh, leg in a paper tube. <laughs> so you have to, like, <laughs> run with a stiff legs or with uh, crutches, you know. So every, uh, every one would have a different kind of uh, prepared uh, uh, 
uh, handicap. Yeah, yeah, we call that a handicap, handicap race. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or we would have also handicap races where you would do something while you run. Like we wanted to do one where uh, people would be drinking a bottle of vodka while they're running. A bottle you know? of vodka. Yeah. Right. So that you know they start getting very tipsy as they come to the end. But then we were warned that you could get like a heart attack while you drank <laughs> and ran at the same time. <laughs> so we didn't do that. <laughs> but you know there could be other ways like eating uh, porridge or something, or a Frankfurter while you ran, you know, and uh, uh, or writing some notes. So it it's always was doing something while running. And uh, we had um, all uh, bicycle, uh, all kinds of bicycle events too, where. For instance, uh, we called it multi-bike uh, vehicle, and that was like a dozen. We never succeeded getting that many bikes, <laughs> but the idea was to have like a dozen or more bicycles all tied together, right. but spaced apart so that each could actually operate it, but tied together with a frame. So there would be like, say, <laughs> three or four bicycles and maybe three or four rows of okay. them, forming like a, oh, quite a big square. It yeah. sort of occupies almost the whole street. And the uh, curious thing is you can't steer it. <laughs> it's sort of goes straight. <laughs> and no way of getting rid of it. I mean, like, you know, <laughs> if, if police said we had to get off the road, there was no way. <laughs> we had to <laughs> Do you look for trouble, George, in your, in your pieces? Or no, no. That? We just um, like to do uh, sort of like gags, you know, funny things. And uh, we hadn't had... Uh, I can't think of any times when we had... Uh, Trouble, problems, you know, with the, uh, the only time when they closed the theater in Nice, but, you know, they, they don't even know what we were going to do, and uh, uh, we're a very mild bunch, <laughs> very <laughs> pacifistic, yeah. You're very lucky also, that's <laughs> true. <laughs> yeah, but we had some things that we planned that then we, we thought it would be too obstructive, uh, like, for instance, uh, have uh, uh, in New York on 5th Avenue and 42nd Street, you saw the very busy intersection. And we planned that four cars would converge on that intersection from four directions, and then all four have flat tire. Oh. <laughs> 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 so, but you know, that we didn't do that. That would put half of Manhattan to a standstill. <laughs> well, that's what we didn't want to do. Um, but um, we did like sort of like a game. There was a street cleaning event, which was uh, done in front of Plaza Hotel in New York. And, but we got permission from Parks Department, and you know, it was very official, it said we're going to s clean one, like, uh, square yard <laughs> of the sidewalk. And the permission said, you know, what tools we're going to use. Then there was even a Parks Inspector that came to see that we really did the <laughs> thorough cleaning of that square, <laughs> the way we said we would. <laughs> and so the tools. we all dressed up like doctors with white coats and had just miniature tools, like toothbrushes, toothpicks, you know, dentist tools, and uh, all kinds of uh, detergents, and then uh, uh, bleach, and then finally with alcohol. It was so white, that square, for a couple <laughs> of weeks it just remained like a big white square, <laughs> very, very clean. What was the audience reaction? Well, they thought we were selling brushes. <laughs> you know, they said, what is this? What, we're selling brushes or cleaning fluids? <laughs> Looking for the cameras? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Cassiera Fruxes. Huh? Yeah. Uh, oh, well, yes, that, there was a, I think in 1966 or thereabouts, there was a, a big show of paper products and art made with paper at the uh, New York City uh, Crafts Museum. And I think that was sponsored by Time and Life and uh, and uh, some paper uh, outfit like uh, I forget the name, one of the big paper manufacturers. So they asked us for both for objects, of which we had several, and also to do a, a concert, like a theater piece, a paper a piece. So we did two pieces. One was like an orchestra playing paper, different paper sounds, and the other one was. Uh, uh, sort of like a dramatic event, uh, a curtain, paper curtain, and uh, there was one uh, archer in Japanese samurai armor, looked very uh, menacing. <laughs> he was shooting 12, he shot 12 arrows into the paper curtain, 
and each time the arrow would hit the curtain, he would, the paper curtain would react like uh, the first time the arrow may bounce off because we would have like piece of plywood behind. Okay. Then a man behind the curtain would spray blue uh, ink or paint so it would look like the spot where the arrow was hit started to get blue, you know, the way the skin gets from impacts. Or the next arrow was went right through the paper, like it got absorbed by it, and then only the feathers came out. Like, you know, the body rejected the feathers. <laughs> it uh, consumed the arrow, but not the feathers. Or, you know, it would bleed, like shaving cream come out, or uh, gong, we would have sometimes a gong behind. So it would hit through the paper, it would hit the gong. Okay. So they were all sound uh, and visual things. Sort of, uh, they ended up to be all, like, funny, you know, the whole idea was uh -huh. like a funny concept. Because, as I say, that's sort of a strong element in most of our things are this uh, element of humor, which right. uh, is carried sometimes when even uh, artist doesn't particularly think he's doing humorous thing, <laughs> but no, it ends no. up to look like, you know, humorous. Well, it's not, it seems to me that the uh, title of that piece was uh, Kill Paper, Not People. Is that yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Well, that was sort of, you know, also two piece, <laughs> and uh, we were killing that paper, and oh, the, the last thing he came, you see, was all done like a Japanese... Uh, 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 attack of arrows, and then he came with a sword and cut the curtain in the bottom, like bowels. <laughs> then we had a big paper uh, from paper tube, like a truss structure, a three-dimensional space frame. Yes. That yeah. came out right over the audience and just sat down on the audience. So they were all like, they were all like in a cage, <laughs> you know, okay. because it just... <laughs> that sort of reminds me of another event where we, we asked to do just a piece of performance for some benefit uh, uh, concert uh, which had uh, followed uh, was followed by uh, like a big dance like, like ballroom dance mm -hmm. and so we were all dressed up like workers and um, uh, we were just hanging uh, actually we were hanging scotch tape on the ceiling like a big net now people thought it was we were just hanging decoration like ribbons you know and they always kept saying why are those workers working here when we're dancing you know I mean, couldn't they have done it before <laughs> we had our overalls and i just said flux worker <laughs> then when we all hung it up big net work of scotch tape then it was supported at four points only so at one signal we could cut all those four points and the whole net came down on the dancers with scotch tape <laughs> they were completely entangled yeah with, with all sticky stuff <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, I mean, they were angry, the dancers. <laughs> <laughs> did you do any food for that? No, not for that, but we usually did food events, uh, like when we had New Year's uh, party, we do each New Year different kind of food event. So, uh, the first one, uh, also in the 60s, uh, we did, um, the theme was to have funny foods, and everybody had to invent some kind of funny food, so, well, um, there, there was a fish, live fish floating in a fish soup, or uh, there was an egg, which um, hard-boiled egg that had no yellow in it, <laughs> only no the white. Yolk. Yeah, no yolk. How was that? That you see, you take a raw egg, blow the whole egg up through two little holes, and then with a syringe you put back only the egg white, and then you hard-boil, <laughs> and you just get a hard-boiled egg. Or there were other things. Instead of egg, you could put, like we put no dry noodles through the little hole, and then boil the whole thing, the noodles will expand, and when you peel it up, and it looks like, you know, uh, brains. <laughs> like, like a chicken has just uh, been there, you know, hatched with only brains. <laughs> so, you know, everybody invented some food. <laughs> then we've done other New Year time, uh, uh, food events where, like, a rainbow, once where we did rainbow colors. All food uh, was set up like a rainbow on a black tablecloth. Or the most recent one we did, uh, we called Food Atlas, where everybody had to bring uh, food from a different country, and then we set it up as a map. As a map? A map of the world, yeah. <clears throat> and then we ate the map up. 